Welcome to our week six mini lecture in 7512 NSC Aviation Leadership and Communication. In previous lectures, we've spoken about the different leadership styles and we spoke about the traits, we spoke about behavior, we spoke about contingency styles. Now we come to the first of the integrative in that leadership styles, charismatic transformational leadership. And also we'll be talking about crisis leadership, which has a link to transformational leadership as well. So we've got a fair amount to get through in this particular lecture. First of all, what are we going to be doing? Well, in the lecture itself, we've got a whole stack of things to do. We're going to be talking about Max Weber's conceptualization of charisma. Charisma is something that we say people have either got or not got. How important is it in leadership? We're going to be talking about transformational leadership. And we'll be talking about saying that some charismatic leaders are transformational, but Transformational leaders are not necessarily charismatic. We're going to be talking about the effects of charismatic and transformational leaders and therefore behaviour dimensions. We're going to be explaining the basis of stewardship and servant leadership. And in the lecture itself, we'll be talking about particular airlines where these do stand out. We're going to be talking about crisis leadership. Some of you may have handled a crisis sometime in your life. And crises can vary from big events to small events. It exists in the mind of the person. But we'll be seeing how important it is to be able to and that respond to crises in an important way. First of all, what do we know about charismatic leaders? We look at Max Weber's concept. And basically, a charismatic leader, according to Max Weber and his research, was one who single-handedly visualises the transcendent mission, that is something that's going well beyond where we've been before and the course of action. And it compels our followers to act in a certain way because they believe that the leader is endowed with special gifts. That is, they're good at firing up followers. They've got great oratorical ability and they have the ability to inspire and build confidence. Person we show on the slide there, one thing that we know is that this person really had that power. Steve Jobs, he really lifted Apple to become a great company by itself. Whenever there was a new product to be released, Steve Jobs got up and he fired up the audience and he fired up people around the world to queue up for hours to go and buy that product. And since he's died, did anyone watch the latest release of the Apple iPhone 6 and the replacement for Jobs? Some people said, boring. He was nothing like Jobs. Doesn't mean he's not a good leader, but Jobs had that special charismatic quality. And this is what we'll look at in certain airlines. We'll see that certain leaders are very charismatic, such as uh, Herb Kelleher from Southwest Airlines. And we'll see some people are almost the opposite of charismatic. Uh, such as um, Michael O'Leary from Ryanair. The one thing that we find is, how do we get these charismatic qualities? You don't get it buying online, but you can actually build up your charismatic qualities. And we'll be talking about ways that you can do. For example, improving your communication skills straight away. You might be a great communicator now, but you can acquire that ability and that'll help your charisma. Being able to develop visionary skills. How do you develop visionary skills? It's not easy, but it can be done, and people have done it. Practicing being candid and unambiguous. For example, why is it you like some speakers and not others? Because some speakers, you instantly understand. You identify the. They make the hard look easy to understand. Developing an enthusiastic, optimistic, and energetic personality. That is some people, when you watch them on screen, you say, that person's got energy. How can you do that as well? What about transformational leaders? Well, transformational leaders are people who really change the world. We spoke about Chief Steve Jobs. But for example, Herb Kelleher and Southwest Airlines. Once upon a time, airlines were only for the rich. But Herb Kelleher brought in the low-cost model with Southwest Airlines. Not only did he bring it in, but he started with only three aeroplanes 
And now what's Southwest Airlines today? It's over 600 aircraft. How did he build it up so quickly? But not only build it up, but people love working with Southwest Airlines. Customers love flying with Southwest Airlines. So a transformational leader can be a very important one. They change the face of the industry. Michael O'Leary from Ryanair copied Kelleher, went across, and Kelleher showed him, this is the way we do it at Southwest. You're talking about Europe. We don't go into Europe, so you're not a competitor. We'll let you look at what we do. And O'Leary copied the model, but he's never been as successful as Herb Kelleher. So we look at transformational leaders. What are they? They're influential, inspirational, charismatic, but not always charismatic. They change the way we do things. That is, they say, why are we doing things this way? There's a much better way to do it. And that's what makes a great leader. They create and share knowledge. They build up the people around them. They don't keep all the power to themselves. They share the power. Richard Branson's a great example of this. And they emphasize the importance of group values and focus followers on their collective interests. And Branson is an excellent example of this. Over 300 companies. But his companies, they're not just there to make money. They've got to make money. It's a business. But they do something good for mankind around the world. And that's what makes Branson a really transformational leader. So if we look at the qualities of transformational charismatic leaders, what are some of the things that stand out? Well, they're passionate. That's the first thing. They're interactive. They're good at working with people. They've got those people skills we spoke about in lecture three. They're also empowering. They don't hog the power to themselves. They share it around because they realize if I build my followers, they'll become better and they'll work better for the company themselves. But they're creative. They're prepared to take risks. And Branson is an excellent example of someone who's put his uh, future on the line many times. And we can see it with his Virgin Intergalactic. It's a really big thing saying we're going to fly people into space as a commercial enterprise. And they've had a setback. But as he said, hey, it's high risk going into space as a passenger, but I'm going to continue with it. So he's really inspirational that way. He's visionary. He can see that this is a future that people are after. And that's why his flights are booked out, flying into space five years in advance. We come to the nature of stewardship and servant leadership. That is, some people go into a company and they see it as, I've achieved what I've always wanted to. I've now got the power. People will look after me. I'll do great things. But stewardship and servant leadership are not about those things. Stewardship is, OK, I'm the head of the company, but I'm just one of a number of heads. That is, people have preceded me, people are going to follow me, and so my job is to make sure that I keep the company in a good, healthy condition. That is, it's not about me. It's about the employees because they build a great company under my direction. Whereas servant leadership is saying, OK, I'm the head of the company, but my job is to make sure that I really do good for others, the followers of the company, the community itself, the customers. I am a servant of the people. And this is one of the things that makes very, very strong leaders in the world today. And in the course, we'll look at people who adopt a stewardship role or a servant leadership role and we'll say, how did they do it and how did that help make them better people but not better people, but highly respected people. Crisis. Crisis is something that we see on the news every day. It can be natural disasters such as tsunamis, terrorist attacks such as 9-11, product failures such as failures of certain drugs or failures of certain aircraft, human error disasters, and we see that in studying the air crash investigations, the unexpected death of key people such as loss of a large part of the Polish government in a air crash over recent years. And of course system failures where we get an error chain building up that causes problems. We'll be looking at the forms of crisis, but particularly what it takes to be a good leader in a crisis. And we'll see that crises, we can't just predict them exactly as they happen. There's a lot of ambiguity. The causes can be building up over years. That is, when a crisis occurs, it may have had its genesis years and years in advance. 
we'll find that simply by being able to train for a crisis doesn't necessarily help stop the crisis from occurring. But we can reduce the impact of it. And so the thing is that leaders have to have a strategic view of crisis and say, I've got to watch the environment that we operate in. What are the sort of things that could be threats to us in the future? How do I make sure that we're prepared for a crisis and make it part of the thinking of the organisation? How can people be uh, empowered to think more about if a crisis occurs, what's my role in the crisis? How can I help, first of all, prevent it or how can I reduce the impact of it? So getting it into the cultural thinking of the organisation itself. We'll talk about the three stages of the crisis management model and we'll give examples of that and we'll do case studies also in the course. We'll talk about pre-crisis planning. First of all, you've got to have a leader. For example, when Qantas had their uh, particular problem uh, with their Airbus 380 on Qantas Flight 32 out of Singapore when the engine exploded, they had a crisis plan ready to initiate. They had a crisis leader to front the media. It wasn't always Alan Joyce, but we found that Olivia Wirth was there fronting the media and being able to react all the time and often appearing with Alan Joyce. We see the crisis response teams and how people that respond themselves and how they use a risk assessment model. And the other thing, of course, is how do we manage during the crisis? What do the leaders have to do? so that everyone is not stepping on someone else's turf. How do we communicate effectively, especially with modern mass media today? For example, when the Asiana Boeing uh, 777 crashed at San Francisco, the first image was on the market shown to people within 45 seconds of the aircraft actually crashing. That's how quick the word spreads. And so we'll be talking about that and making sure that we've got the crisis leader and the team able to respond to that. And also, how do we solve the crisis itself? So, if we consider, once the crisis has passed, we don't just down tools and say, well, we did a good job there and walk away. We've got to sit back and say, how well did we do in this? What did we do well at? What didn't we do so well at? Pick up the lessons learned and then make sure we incorporate that into the processes for the future so that we can respond better to a crisis in the future, or better still, even prevent that crisis. Crisis communication, as I said, is a really important one. That is, if you're slow in getting the communication out during a crisis, social media these days will help fill the vacuum, and they mightn't fill it very favourably on your behalf. So you've got to make sure that you've got all this system set up. Who's going to be your public spokesman? How do they interact with the rest of the media? How does the CEO work with that crisis spokesman? That is, when will the CEO speak versus when will they have the spokesperson talking? And being honest and accurate all the time, because as soon as you're dishonest or inaccurate, people pick it up and your firm's reputation could be ruined, not just permanently, but perhaps in the uh, future years. And we've seen that with different crises that have occurred in the past. Rolls-Royce and uh, QF32 didn't react very well and they didn't help their reputation at all. So we've got a lot to cover in this lecture, but understanding charisma, how you can help your own charisma, what makes a good transformational leader, what skills do you need to become a transformational leader for the future, or how, as a follower, can you help transformation in organisations, stewardship and servant leadership, how does this fit in with what we've studied so far in the courses? And crises, we can't stop them from happening, but we can either prevent them or reduce their impact by being prepared for them and showing good leadership. Thank you.